The white smoke. Fumata. That curled into the Vatican night at 7.06pm local time. Wednesday the 13th of March 2013. Sent, as we saw it ourselves, thousands of spectators in St. Peter's Square into raptures and sparked a frenzy of surprised excitement across the world. It signaled that Argentina's Archbishop of Buenos Aires, your game, Bergoglio, now headed the Catholic Church. As soon as Bergoglio was chosen, Giovanni Battista's uh, first question to him was, what name would you like to be known by? To which you replied, I shall be called Francis the First. Now, there's no doubt that he makes an interesting catalogue, I suppose, of Catholic firsts. Not merely, and obviously the one that we mentioned, he's the first to choose Francis as his name. He's the first non-European Pope in almost 1,500 years as well, the first ever Pope out of the Southern Hemisphere and from the Americas, the first that has come along and succeeded a Pope who has stepped down, abdicated in six centuries, and most significantly, the first Jesuit. Most intriguingly, and at that point you don't have to pardon the pun, Fact is that today, as we sit here, we now have two popes. One black and one white, both members of the Roman Catholic Jesuit order. More of that black pope in a moment or two. Everything around the election of this Argentinian pope has been very carefully choreographed. We're placing sustain on the note here. With all of the media reports that here is a man of personal simplicity. Here is a humble man who fits seamlessly into the days of austerity in which we find ourselves today. Because here is a man who was chosen to live in poverty all his life. Much has been made of his work in a giant slum in Buenos Aires known only as 21 to 24. Where 45,000 people live in extreme poverty. For 15 years, Bergoglio rode the 70 bus several times a year. Then he walks in his priest's robes, those normal robes, through this dangerous neighborhood in Buenos Aires to celebrate Mass at a tiny, of course not an imposing church, but a makeshift church of the Virgin of Cocupe. He is adored by everyone here. I would say you'd find a photo of him in 60% of the homes in 21 to 24 said one of the Roman Catholic priests, Joanne, is as Mende, who holds Bergoglium in an almost saintly regard. Instead of taking up residence in a luxurious mansion that came part and parcel of the job as being Archbishop in Argentina, Bergoglio chose to lead a Spartan life, living in a small apartment, preparing his own meals, turning down a chauffeur-driven car in fever of going along by public bus. How appropriate then that when he was leaving the conclave, having been elected Pope in that conclave, there was a much publicised, earthy moment when Francis I boarded the bus with the other cardinals rather than up to get into the private car that was waiting for him. And again, in his first appearance, Pope Francis drew further attention to his humility by shunning protocol, passing up on the formal accoutrements in favour of wearing a simple white cassock no red overgarment, and asking for those who were following him that they would bless him. Then there is the most significant matter of his choice of footwear, not forgetting his wristwatch, instead of the traditional red shoes. Francis wore black. Definitely not a Prada pair. 
to impress the Italians all around him, but old black ones that he brought with him all the way from Argentina, and also an ordinary wristwatch with a thick black band, and in these black shoes and black banded watch, he celebrates his first mass as Pontiff. Now, these are all items that the fashion conscious among us are bound to notice. We surely didn't miss them. Others make even more of their significance. One Roman jeweller has praised Pope Francis' decision to turn his back on the precious things, even though it'll do nothing much for his trade in jewel ring. He said, it's not great news for us goldsmiths. But I personally think it is a potent gesture which holds a message of renewal For the church, it's an obvious choice also for a Pope who comes from a poor country. Mr. Poverty, Mr. Austerity, Mr. Humility is now our Pope. Not, of course, in a literal personal sense. Even the early speeches of this new Pope have been lauded as sermons. The word evangelical has been used many more times than simply once. In fact, William Crawley on Sunday sequence on Sunday morning past was positively purring as he described him as sounding like an evangelical preacher half the time. And the so-called notable evangelicals of the world are purring too. America's most famous pastor, Rick Warren, of the Saddleback Church in California, called on his followers through Twitter, and those followers numbered over 900,000 people, to join me today in fasting and prayer for the 115 cardinals seeking God's will in a new leader. And if that wasn't enough, John Piper of Desiring God Ministries decided to give us the wording of his own prayer. O Lord of truth and mercy, put in place a Pope most willing to reform the Catholic Church in accord with your most holy word. This is serious. Does this mean that Warren thinks that the Pope really is the Holy Father? God's representative here on earth is maintained by Catholic doctrine? Does he really think that those 115 cardinals in Rome gathered together in solemn conclave were fulfilling God's will? In this charade of electing a pope, does Rick Warren agree with the Catholic Church doctrines on salvation by works, transubstantiation, the mass, purgatory or salvation after you die, and many other heresies. And Mr. Piper, how is any Pope ever going to reform the Catholic Church from within when history shows that this never has been done? Luther had to get out, Calvin had to get out, all the others had to come out. And when scripture never endorses staying within an organization as corrupt as this one, but rather commands us to come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. 2 Corinthians six seventeen. The position of the reformers and the orthodox Protestants, As far as the office of the Roman pontiff is concerned, that's plainly stated. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 25, section 6, which reads, There is no other head of the church but the Lord Jesus Christ. Nor can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that Antichrist. That man of sin and son of perdition that exalteth himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God. Truth is, therefore, 
that it is anti-scriptural to assert that it is God's will. That there should be a Pope in the first place. Check it out in Matthew 23, 8 to 10, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 to 4, verses 8 to 9 as well, Revelation 13 and 6 for another reference. Now, no Bible-believing Protestant will therefore fast and pray before God that he would guide those 115 Roman cardinals in electing yet another the 265th, some say, 266th man of sin and son of perdition. It wasn't God's will that one of them should take on this office. Never mind all of them. Nor will any truly reformed and evangelical Christian believe that God would be acting in accord with either his mercy or acting in accord with his truth by putting in place a pope to reform the Catholic Church. My question is, is this the best that we have in terms of evangelical leaders today and thousands follow after their ministries and listen to every one of their words? Men who among us are those who have drunk of the wine of her fornication, Revelation 17 and 2, and if this is the best we have, then we have good reason to sorrow. My appeal tonight is this. Do not be fooled. By the media circus of the Cardinal's conclave, despite all the corruption and all the scandals and the stench that is coming out of her, Rome still has the uncanny knack of hypnotizing a naive and a gullible world. Don't be calm. By the emergence of Mr. Humility and Mr. Poverty, leader of the over one billion Catholics of this world. Because the truth of the matter is this. In Rome's global greed for gold, she has fleeced these people. And she has driven them into poverty in the first place. Nor should you buy into the thought that the elevation of this Jesuit... So the role of the Pope will prove to be the inspired act that sweeps the Vatican and cleans up this apostate church. Like all others who have taken on this office, he is now the chief usurper on the globe. By the very titles he bears, he lays personal claim to every person in the Godhead, ensuring that he fits into the black shoes of the Antichrist in Second Thessalonians 2 verses 3 to 4. That the new Pope is a Jesuit. And at that the first one ever is big news. But it is not good news. Let me explain why. We're looking at the tradition of the Jesuits. The tradition of the Jesuits and we need to begin here and put them into their historical setting and context where they were, how they have operated down through the generations of time because that's essential to understanding the aims and how they intend to achieve those aims. So the tradition of the Jesuits, first of all, their appearance. The Jesuit society or the so-called society of Jesus was founded by Ignatius of Loyola, Spanish knight and soldier, born in 1491, eight years after the birth of Martin Luther. So in point of time, historical context, Loyola's life ran parallel to Martin Luther's, but in every respect, he was the complete opposite, the antithesis of what Luther was. Ignatius of Loyola was injured in battle at the Spanish border fortress of Pamphluna in the year 1521. That was the same year as Luther was appearing on trial in the Diet of Worms. After Loyola was wounded in 1521, he fell into a delirious fever in which he claims to have had visions of the Virgin. 
And he's saying that she gave him a divine commission to pursue a new path. To become a general in an army of saints instead of an army of soldiers. His leg had been in that battle severely wounded. So there was a long period of convalescence that followed. During that time he became increasingly alarmed at the widespread success of Protestantism right across Europe. He could see it stretching from the various cantons of Switzerland through to the hills and the glens of Scotland, from the Saxon colonists of Hungary and Transylvania across Germany into the growing populations of England and even over here into the northern part of the island of Ireland. Ignatius of Loyola followed through on his determination that he would form a new order. A society of spiritual knights for the purpose of combating the Protestant Reformation. Though the Church of Rome at the time pretended that Luther's just a little distraction and they dismissed him and his Reformation as merely a German squabble. In reality, they were panic stricken by the spread of this new religious awakening. By the loosening of their grip and the shattering of their control over the continent of Europe. When Loyola the soldier took this idea of a new vigorous order of men, an army of men, into the office of Pope Paul III. The Pope was only too willing at this time of crisis for the Vatican to use all the services of everybody and anybody who pledged themselves to fight what they called the new Protestant heresy by whatever means at their disposal. Loyola himself said that he was offering his services to the Pope for the purposes of fighting against the enemies of the church. And when the Pope saw his plans for the formalization of the Jesuit society as a new monastic order, he seemed to have shouted out, this is the finger of God. Therefore this new order. The company of Jesus or the society of Jesus or soldiers of God or as determined now God's marines was sanctioned by Pope Paul III in 1540. The century of the Reformation. They took oaths of chastity and poverty and obedience and found out to overthrow the work of the Protestant Reformation wherever they found it. Now it won't come as a surprise to you, I know it won't, to learn that Ignatius of Loyola was an enthusiastic devotee of the Virgin Mary. Or that in the process of time he has become Saint Ignatius, known as the patron saint of soldiers. That's how it appeared. The Jesuit movement, its aims. The aim of the Jesuits was to inspire and revive an enthusiasm for the Romanism that existed before Reformation times. So they were the champions of popery and they were selected for the task of going out there and counteracting the dawn of the light. Extinguishing that light wherever it had burst into flame among the European nations. Pulling them all back into the darkness and dominion of Rome again. For that reason they took St. Francis of Assisi and the medieval saints as their role models. And they tried to restore the authority of the medieval church that the reformers had shattered. That's why this... New Pope on the block has taken this name, Francis I, going back to Francis of Assisi, the medieval church, back to the darkness of Rome when it was in total control. Hector McPherson says in his book, The Jesuits in History, that Loyola, in framing the constitution of the new order, set himself to stop the emancipating process by making more rigorous the despotism of Rome. So the Jesuits wanted 
Not only a return to the Romish er to the Romish errors of the Dark Ages, but they wanted to reinforce those errors with greater rigor than ever before. This was Loyola's project. And even before he died in the year 1556, he had founded more by that stage than 100 Jesuit colleges or houses for training Jesuits. There was a, an additional immense number of educational establishments under Jesuit influence. He had marshaled by that year, 1556, when he died, over 1,000 Jesuits. There are, by the way, 20,000 of them today, who were actively and aggressively at work all over the world, bent like their church on world domination. He had divided Europe, India, Africa, Brazil into 12 Jesuit provinces, in each of which he had his Jesuit officer stationed to the most notorious worm, Francis Xavier, a name that came up recently round the papal enclave. He worked predominantly in Asia, where he carried out mass conversions. Another chief officer was Peter Canisius, and he was instrumental in the re-Romanization of southern Germany. But on the top of the pile, ruling all, giving instructions, Loyola was acknowledged general of all these men. At the top of the society of Jesuits today is the black pope. Loyola was called the general, the black pope was called the superior general ever since. And although Loyola was residing in Rome, he was wielding an influence over the world, rivaling that of popes and of kings. We had back then what we could call a trinity of evil. We had the Council of Trent, we had the Inquisition, and we had backing all of that up and following their mandate, the Jesuit order. So what you have is Rome going out and they have a devilish fork in their hand and there are three prongs in that fork to counteract the Protestant Reformation. The Council of Trent. It met on and off for almost two decades. Between 1545-1563 it was opposing drafting up documents, opposing with a vengeance Luther's doctrine of sola scriptura, the Bible alone. The Council of Trent. Then we had the Inquisition. This was the third in a line of Inquisitions. Authorized this time by Pope Paul III in a papal boom in 1542. And the leading principle of the Inquisition was, in its own words, to heretics. And especially to Calvinists. No toleration must be granted. Well, it's important to recognize that the reinstatement of this inquisition in the 16th century was spearheaded by the Jesuits. And the atrocities performed in its name were organized by the Jesuits. Some have come up with the figure that in that century alone no less than 900,000 Protestants were martyred for the cause of Jesus Christ. So we can say that the Council of Trent was the debating chamber where all these Romish doctrines that had been exposed as false by the reformers were reaffirmed and re-ratified. The Inquisition was the court set up to judge all of those and punish those who refused to comply with their ecclesiastical rulings. And the Jesuits, the third prong in the devil's fork here, were both the self-appointed henchmen of that court and the missionaries sent out to propagate and enforce its falsehoods worldwide by whatever means came to their hands. Hans Hillerbrand put it very well in his book, The Reformation, when he suggests a comparison between the Jesuits and the Nazi brown shirts of the Hitler era. 
In fact, you can trace a quote freely available on the, on the internet where Hitler is saying, I founded my organization on the Jesuit model. The Jesuits, Hillerbrand says, were the feared and formidable stormtroops of the counter reformation. Apart from that very open rule, the Jesuits have also been crucial to the papacy because of their secrecy and their underhand and their conspiratorial and behind the scenes, under the table activities. And the Pope still has thousands of these active agents worldwide, many of them holding high political, commercial, military positions, even in nominally Protestant countries. For example, if you turn your eye over the Atlantic and into America, over the years there have been many CIA, Central Intelligence Agency bosses, who were also Knights of Malta or Jesuit trained. The current head of the CIA appointed this year is John O. Brennan, the descendant of Irish immigrants from Roscommon. He began his schooling by attending the Immaculate Heart of Mary Elementary School. He moved through another college before enrolling at Fordham University in New York City, the major Jesuit school in America. He spent a lot of time learning Arabic in later years as well. Not under his watch, but the CIA were those who were pumping weaponry. Into the hands of Al-Qaeda, believe it or not, when they were fighting in Benghazi, in Libya. They're at it all over the place. The Vatican, of course, has its own intelligence service, includes Jesuits, includes the Knights of Columbus, includes the Knights of Maltum, includes Opus Dei, and others. So we've got their aim, we've got their appearance, we will also look at their approval. Pope Paul III was glad of the Jesuits coming in in the form of Ignatius of Loyola and offering to battle the Reformation in the 16th century. And from that time until now, though at times the relationship of Jesuits with the Vatican has ebbed and flowed and sometimes broken out into open hostility, Roman pontiffs, by and large, are still happy to have them about and still regard them as the gift of God to Catholicism. For example... Recent popes, the two most recent, prior to Francis I, popes John Paul II and Benedict XVI appointed ten Jesuit cardinals to notable jobs. So in that conclave of the 115, there were a few Jesuit cardinals sprinkled through the ranks. They were promoted by the former Pope Benedict XVI and praised by him on the 22nd of April 2006, for example, at the Feast of Our Lady, Mother of the Society of Jesus, Pope Benedict XVI greeted thousands of Jesuits who were on pilgrimage to Rome and he took the opportunity then to thank God for having granted to your company the gift of men of extraordinary sanctity and of exceptional apostolic zeal, such as St. Ignatius of Loyola, St. Francis Xavier, and Peter Faber. He went on to say, St. Ignatius of Loyola was above all a man of God. Who gave the first place of his life to God, to his greater glory and his greater service. He was a man of profound prayer, which found its centre and its culmination in the daily Eucharistic celebration. His prayer drove him daily to Mass. That's what he's saying. Do you notice what he does say about him? A man of extraordinary sanctity, exceptional, apostolic zeal. The Jewish authorities said exactly the same about Paul. When as Saul he went out breathing threatenings and slaughter against the church of Jesus Christ. And that's what Ignatius did as well. The 35th General Congregation of the Society of Jesus convened just a few years ago, the 5th of January 2008. And they elected Adolfo Nicholas as the new Supreme 
general, the head of the Jesuits, on the 19th of January 2008. Just a month after that, the Pope, Benedict XVI, received members of that general congregation and he urged them to continue on the path of this mission in full fidelity to your original charism. He asked them to reflect so as to rediscover the fullest meaning of your characteristic fourth vow of obedience to the successor of Peter. We'll come back to that. The congregation of Jesuits that day responded with a formal declaration they entitled with new fervor and dynamism. The Society of Jesus responds to the call of Benedict XVI and they confirmed there they would be loyal to the Pope. Now having been promoted, having been praised by him, having looked to them for loyalty, they have now replaced him with their own man. We'll move into antagonism. Because with the Jesuits, it's an area you have to visit. Antagonism. Among the nations of Europe, after the Reformation, the Jesuits kind of tripped over their own success. And after those nations had the Jesuits working in and out among them, for a number of generations, they find what is happening here. Our national freedom is being undermined. It's been destroyed. These men are ruining our country. Just like the old ecclesiastical empire of the Roman church had done before the Reformation. We are descending into darkness again. Our liberties are going. So much mischief was performed by those Jesuits. That over 70 countries expelled them. Four-fifths of those countries, 80%, were Roman Catholic countries. And they were cursed and denounced for their, their hypocrisy by 11 popes. Although, of course, the doors had closed then, have now all opened up again, and they've been reinstated in every one of those places. Protestant Switzerland was the country that acted most decisively against them, and for the longest period of time, but even there, the ban was lifted, though only very recently. It was only in 1954 that they were allowed back into Norway. In 1989, six Jesuit scholars, priests, were killed by a counterinsurgency battalion of the Salvadorian army. On the 20th anniversary of that massacre, the new president of El Salvador Mariko Funes awarded the Order of Jose Matias Delgado the Grand Cross with the Gold Star. It's the greatest recognition that can be granted by the Salvadoran government, and it was granted to the six murdered scholars, priests of the Jesuit order. Intriguingly, President Mariko Funes was educated by the Jesuits. In El Salvador. And for some further assessment of the Jesuits, think of these famous quotes. John Adams, second president of the United States of America, he said, My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities, and is very particular and very horrible. There, the Jesuit orders, restoration in 1814 by Pope Pius VII is indeed a step toward darkness, cruelty, despotism, and death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits if ever there was a body of men who merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell. It is this society of Ignatius de Leola. Marcus de Lafayette, French statesman and general, who served in the American Continental Army under the command of General George Washington during the American Revolutionary War, said, It is my opinion that if the liberties of this country, the United States of America, are destroyed, it will be by the subtlety 
of the Roman Catholic Jesuit priests, for they are the most crafty, dangerous enemies to civil and religious liberty. They have instigated most of the wars of Europe. Abraham Lincoln, 16th president of the USA, said the war, and he was talking about the American Civil Wars, 1861 to 1865, the war would never have been possible without the sinister influence of the Jesuits. Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte, French emperor, said the Jesuits are a military organization, not a religious order. Their chief is a general of an army, not the mere father abbot of a monastery. And the aim of this organization is power. Power in its most despotic exercise. Absolute power. Universal power. Power to control the world by the volition of a single man. That is the black. Pope, the superior general of the Jesuits, he went on to say, Napoleon did, Jesuitism is the most absolute of despotisms and at the same time the greatest and most enormous of abuses. That's the tradition of the Jesuits. And it really doesn't recommend itself. I wonder are these evangelical preachers rather pleased with themselves that having as one claimed fasted and prayed and encouraged nearly a million other followers to do the same that this is what we've got. A man in this line the tradition of the Jesuits the tactics with the Jesuits. If we were to believe the claims of the Jesuits that appear in their own writings. We'd be deceived into thinking, in fact, if we were to tune in to all the local media stations, all the rest of it, the global channels that are going out around the time when the Pope was voted in, we'd be deceived into thinking that the primary purpose of the Jesuits was to follow the teaching and example of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel, to bring about the salvation of humanity, to perform charitable works, to do all you can to look after the poverty-stricken of the world. Oh, they certainly have the name, the Society of Jesus. Their symbol that they use gives the impression, again, of loyalty to Jesus. The Jesuit seal contains in its center what they call a Christogram, three letters, I-H-S. Surrounding that is a Basically the face of a son. Now others have explained it much differently. And have claimed that IHS is a link into Egyptian gods and goddesses. But they themselves claim, the Jesuits, that it's derived from the first three letters of the Greek name of Jesus. Also IHS is connected with the Latin phrase, Jesus, homonym, Salvator, or Jesus, Saviour of man. In addition, IHS is sometimes interpreted as another Latin phrase, standing for in hoc signo vinces, or in this sign will I conquer. And under those words you have the three nails on the seal of the society of Jesus. I find it interesting when it was released after his election that each pope will take an official papal coat of arms designed the way they want it to be designed and Pope Francis' official papal coat of arms features, as you would expect, the Jesuit seal. IHS, surrounded by this sunburst. Below the sunburst, on the bottom left of the shield, is a star symbolizing Mary. And at the bottom right of the shield, a nard flower representing Joseph. This man may pay lip service to Jesus in his public announcements, but rest assured, merely captivates his highest devotion. Adrian, 
Salbut Chai is a political analyst, author, speaker, radio, TV commentator in Argentina, and he provides us with this information. Monsignor Bergoglio is an ardent devotee of the Virgin Mary, whose protection he invoked in his very first message, Erbi et Orbi. So he speaks of Jesus, but he serves Mary. Typical Jesuitry, you could say. In almost every language, the term Jesuitical has come to imply deceit, duplicity, craftiness, cunning, the kind of deceit, duplicity, double dealing that we saw in our Bible reading tonight in Judges 14. Dealing with what was foisted on Samson. Nearly every dictionary that Rome hasn't succeeded in influencing or censoring includes the second, more accurate definition of a Jesuit as one given to subtle casualty. Deceitfulness. Duplicity. How often has it been said of a politician who has stepped out of line, he's a Jesuit. And the meaning is they're the very opposite of men of honor and men of godliness and men of truthfulness and men of good reputation. He's a Jesuit. The real aim of the Jesuits is stated in no uncertain terms by German historian Greisinger in his book History of the Jesuits. And that real aim is to attain universal dominion for themselves. Exactly what Napoleon and many others observed. They're on a quest for universal domination. Now that's what makes them so indispensable to the Vatican system. Because absolute temporal ruling power has always been the Vatican's primary goal. For this purpose, Greisinger says they adopted the following methods. And here are the tactics. Of the Jesuits throughout time. You'll see the modern application today as well. But first he's saying. To acquire the education of youth. Especially the sons of the nobility. And this on account of their talents and learning. They were most successful in doing. Jesuits are known. For being the intellectuals. Among the priests. With them. Formation for priesthood normally takes. Not two years. Four years. But between eight and fourteen years. Depending on a man's background, depending on his previous education, final vows are taken several years after that again, making the Jesuit formation among the longest of any of the religious orders. They run top colleges and schools. You'll have one attached to Oxford University. In England it's called Campion Hall. Xavier College in Melbourne, St. Ignatius College in Riverview in Sydney, Australia, 28 Jesuit colleges and universities and two theological centers in the United States of America, Fordham University, New York City, Boston, of course, Boston University, should ring a bell or two, two of the most famous Jesuit colleges there are in America. So, first, their method, their tactic, acquire the education of youth. Second, to become the confessors. Of all persons and power and authority which enable them from their profound knowledge of human passions and weaknesses to obtain complete influence over these persons and through them to direct all affairs of the state. So come and confess to us. We'll now know your sins and we'll throw them back in your face because we'll knock on your door and say, you know that you're guilty of this. Well, if you don't do what we are saying here in state, in government, through politics, then we're going to expose you for what you are and what you've done. It's the way they've always operated. Others have learned from that, of course. Third tactic, the acquirement of wealth. Oh, yes, this poverty-stricken new pope. The acquirement of wealth is what the Jesuit order is all about, partly by trade and partly by inducing the superstitious to leave their properties to them at their death. By these means, although the individual Jesuit took the vow of poverty, the riches of the society were enormous. 
fourth tactic. Their object was the complete destruction of Protestantism and the extermination of all Protestants as being the most formidable opponents to their dominion. To attain this end, they never ceased to urge Catholics and Catholic princes to wage war against the Protestants, to destroy them by fire and sword and wholesale massacres. In Protestant countries where they had little influence, their plan was to adopt disguises, especially that of Protestant ministers, in order gradually to pervert the religion of the people and as far as possible direct the policy of the state. In the case of those kings or statesmen, whether Catholic or not, who were hostile to or stood in the way of their designs, they made use of two weapons to remove them from their paths. Calumny and assassination, that is to say, falsehood and murder. The special weapons and characteristics of the devil. John 8.44 Check it out. What's said about the devil? He doesn't abide in the truth. He steals their very bodies. A liar and a murderer. From the beginning, these are the tools of their trade. Now, these tools, these tactics were all put into play to maximum effect during the Counter-Reformation back in the 16th century when the Jesuits began and when they spread. And the Pope soon realised these Jesuits have become indispensable to us, to the very survival of Popery. And so they virtually handed over the Roman Catholic institution into the hands of the Jesuits. And the papacy was rewarded for doing that because those Jesuits became its tireless champions spawning through Europe, trawling the territories and beginning to advance the Roman Catholic Church again after it's set back by the Protestant Reformation. But the cost was great. For the black pope and his disciples, the superior general of the Jesuits, became the real power behind the people throne. And they still are the real power. Francis I becoming the white pope is still dominated by the black pope. They've got the both positions, but one is a puppet, the other one is the real power. Step by step, their influence grew. In the nations of the world, the popes granted them even bigger privileges and powers. Gregory the Thirteenth, for example, gave them the right to enter into commerce and banking. And they flogged that right to the death in years to come. By 1556, they were actively involved in fighting Protestantism in France, in Germany, Portugal, Spain, Italy, England. And they were also to be found hard at work in India, China, Japan, the New World. Nagasaki, a German or a Japanese city, where they landed was given to them. They had a big base there. In working to stamp out Protestantism, they were using these two tactics. Getting into the country politically, exercising influence over the ruler, the rulers of the country, driving that ruler to get out there and persecute the Protestants, drive them out, make life hard, religiously, as we've mentioned, infiltrating the Protestant churches, denominations, becoming ministers. The devil himself transformed into an angel of light, working to undermine those churches from within. Ever wonder why there are so many ecumenists? You wouldn't quite know who they are or who they're serving. Certainly not the Lord Jesus Christ or the interests of his church. So that's the counter-reformation of the 16th century and all of their tactics brought to bear there. And then in the plots against English Protestantism in the 16th and in the 17th centuries, the Jesuits were right at the heart of all of that. Just after they founded the order, the Jesuits established seminaries, universities in the continent of Europe. And that was the purpose they had of getting young Englishmen, noblemen, bringing them over onto the continent of Europe, training them up in the Jesuit college, sending them back as Roman Catholic missionaries. And they were sent back as traitors to subjugate their country, to bring it under the Pope of Rome. Those Jesuit spies trained on the continent of Europe spread through England during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. 
in various disguises under fictitious names. They were preaching, they were hearing confessions, they were giving mass, and they were printing and distributing pamphlets against the Queen and against the Anglican institution. They were accusing Elizabeth of various sins and plotting her assassination and overthrow. The various Jesuit plots, when I was teaching out of the Whitfield College by correspondence course church history many years ago, we charted these plots. I think there were about 11 of them at least, all launched by Jesuits at their heart. Do you know who was the instigator, the chief instigator in one of them? Edmund Campion recognised the name. Oh, that's the part of the university in Oxford. Campion Hall, named after him, the Jesuit plotter who wanted to kill the Queen. He was endorsed right from the top layer. Pope Gregory, and there's documentation in the public record office in London that tells us Pope Gregory sanctioned the assassination of England's Queen and the Jesuits were sent and did their level best to carry that assassination out. They were also heavily involved in plans for the invasion of England by Roman Catholic Spain in 1588, the Spanish Armada. And in 1584-85, the act against Jesuit seminary priests and other such like disobedient persons was passed in England, ordering all Jesuits to leave the country within 40 days because of their rebellions, particularly the plots to kill Queen Elizabeth. But the Jesuits didn't give up. They continued to plot the assassination of the king, the invasion of England by Spain, and even when the Spanish Armada was smashed, God blew with his wind, and they were scattered, that didn't deflect them from their original goal. As late as 1594, six years after the Armada floundered on the coasts of our island, at least seven Jesuits banded together, plotting again to murder Queen Elizabeth. When King James I came to the throne, the Jesuits planned what has become known as the Gunpowder Plot. In the year 1605, blowing up the king, blowing up parliament, and the Protestant nobles in the land, Guy Fox was their tool. But behind him were a whole company of Jesuits. They were caught, discovered, and hanged on account of that plot. In 1628, an act was passed in England against sending to the continent to be popishly bred any young person. That's how they termed it in Parliament back then. The purpose of that act, of course, was to flitch out those English men who were the spies of the Jesuits. Well, eventually the bill for legalising Jesuitism was set down for its second reading in the House of Commons, June the 7th, 1899. Eventually, 200 plus years later, they're being brought back into the country again. At that time, the Protestant echo warned the public of the likely consequences by quoting the words of Reverend Dr. J. A. Wiley, author of the book, Jesuitism, Its Rise, Progress and Insidious Workings. And that Protestant echo said back then, to what country of Europe shall we turn? Where we are not able to track the Jesuit by his bloody footprints. How many assassins they sent to England to murder Elizabeth, his history attests. Nor is it only the palaces of monarchs into which they have crept with their doctrines of murder and assassination, the very sanctuary of their own popes they have defiled with blood. In the gunpowder plot, we see them deliberately planning to destroy, at one blow, the gentry and nobility of England. To them, we owe those civil wars, which for so many years, drenched with blood, the fair provinces of France. They laid the train of that crowning horror, the St. Bartholomew Massacre. Philip II and the Jesuits share between them the guilt of the invincible Armada. What a harvest of plots, tumults, seditions, revolutions, torturings, poisonings, assassinations, regicides, the killing of the king, and massacres has Christendom reaped from the seed sown by the Jesuits. We haven't time to go into it. 
They were behind World War I. They were also behind World War II. You can check it. It is well documented. And in our own country, behind the promotion of the IRA, Ronald Cook in the IRA and ethnic cleansing in Ulster today wrote, the Roman Catholic clergy is up to its proverbial ears in the violence in Ulster. The Roman Catholic clergy, another quote, have done much more than merely give moral support to the IRA assassins. They have helped the IRA murderers in various ways. Documented evidence is overwhelming for that. As everybody knows, wrote Peter Trumper in Machiavellian Lessons, these past 30 years, the Jesuit Brigade in Ulster, Dublin and America has been gradually edging its way towards the goal of a united Ireland determined to have it at any and at all costs, primarily by foul means. What tug of war is the PSNI involved in at this moment in time? Right as we assemble here, they're looking for the transcripts of taped interviews with convicted IRA bomber Dolores Price. And those interviews, where are they held? By the Jesuit Boston College. Even the Pope, as one of the quotes I've cited, refers to even the Pope, the White Pope, is not safe from their activities. It's not for nothing that the head of the Jesuits is often referred to as this, the Black Pope and considered a rival to or superior to the White Pope. Alexander Robertson says, the general of the Jesuits, the Black Pope, is the real and only Pope. The one who bears the title, i.e. Pope Francis I now, is but a figurehead. It is the Jesuits' policy he pursues, their voice that speaks through him, their hand that guides him. Although the Jesuits bow down before and profess obedience to the Pope, history shows that any Pope that has dared oppose them is wiped out. Clement XIV, 1769 to 1774, for example, tried to suppress the Jesuit order in 1773. When he was signing the bull to suppress them, he remarked, I am signing my death warrant. Shortly afterwards, he was poisoned and died in great torment. The same thing had already occurred when Sixtus V, from 1585 to 1590, he was Pope, attempted in his day to reform the Jesuit society in the year 1590. He died mysteriously, but right on cue. Therefore, the well-known Italian proverb, when the order of Jesus, that's the society of Jesuits, gives out a litany, the holy chair will become vacant. Maybe Benedict slid off while still alive before he slid off dead. Little wonder an English Roman Catholic wrote in 1602 his preface to a Jesuit catechism that he had concocted to receive Jesuits into a kingdom is to receive a vermin which at length will gnaw out the heart of the state both spiritual and temporal. They work underhand the ruin of the countries where they dwell and the murder of whatsoever kings and princes it pleases them. To go back to a comment made recently because the last one I made was 1602. Let's bring it right up to date. Previous Pope Benedict XVI. In February 2008, we referred to how he received members of the General Congregation of the Society of Jesus, and he urged them then, as there before him, to continue on the path of this mission in full fidelity to your original charism. And he asked them to reflect so as to rediscover the fullest meaning of your characteristic fourth vow of obedience to the successor of Peter. Now, if you were to read in the web, you'll find that this fourth vow of obedience to the successor of Peter, apparently, it says this. 
I further promise a special obedience to the sovereign pontiff in regard to the missions according to the same apostolic letters and the constitution. So we give our obedience to the Pope. If you were to be in possession of the 1913 congressional record in the US, you will find that this fourth vow of obedience to the successor of Peter is phrased somewhat differently, to say the very least about it. Other documents, other people have turned it up as well. They refer to this Jesuit oath of the fourth vow. It's one that the other orders don't take. They take three. The Jesuits have an additional fourth, and they call it the blood oath. And the text of the oath is apparently this, I, now in the presence of Almighty God, the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Blessed St. John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles, St. Peter and St. Paul, and all the saints, sacred host of heaven, and to you, my ghostly father, the superior general of the Society of Jesus, that's the Black Pope, founded by St. Ignatius Loyola, in the pontification of Paul III, and continued to the present, do by... The womb of the Virgin, the matrix of God, and the rod of Jesus Christ declare and swear that His Holiness the Pope is Christ, Vice Regent, and is the true and only head of the Catholic or Universal Church throughout the earth. And it goes on and on and on. And I'm just breaking into it again. This is their oath that I will go to any part of the world whithersoever I may be sent, to the frozen regions north, jungles of India, to the centres of civilization of Europe, or to the wild taunts of the barbarous savages of America, without murmuring or repining, and will be submissive in all things whatsoever is communicated to me. I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war, secretly and openly, against all heretics, Protestants, and Masons, as I am directed to do, to extirpate them from the face of the whole earth, and that I will spare neither aid, sex, nor condition, and that will hang, burn, waste, boil, flay, strangle, and bury alive these infamous heretics, rip up the stomachs and wombs of their women and crush their infants' heads against the walls in order to annihilate their execrable wreaths. When the same cannot be done openly, I will secretly use the poisonous cup, the strangulation cord, the steel of the poniard, or the leaden bullet, regardless of the honour, rank, dignity, or authority of the persons, whatever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I at any time may be directed, so to do, by any agents of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Father of the Society of Jesus. And on and on and on it goes. You can see why it's called the blood oath. And then they received the wafer from the superior, write their name with the point of a dagger, dipped in their own blood, taken from over their own heart. That's how they sign. So what can we expect from the pontificate of Francis I? Well, he will have a plan. They do have a plan. In 2002, Boston College President William P. Leahy initiated the church in the 21st century program as a means of moving the church from crisis to renewal. Let's look at sex abuse cases, he was saying. Let's look at the priesthood, celibacy, homosexuality, women's roles, the role of the people, the laity. We have a plan, a program, but it will, however, be more of the same. Intrigue. Both inside and outside the Vatican. Already an allegation has snaked its way over from Argentina following this Pope into office regarding his betrayal, they claim, of two Jesuit priests in Argentina. Now that allegation has always been denied. But on Sunday past, 17th of March 2013, an Argentinian newspaper published a government memo that seems to definitely prove that Bergoglio did indeed provide information to the murderous dictatorship, the junta in Argentina at that time, informing the authorities about allegations against two Jesuit priests who were then kidnapped, tortured, imprisoned for five months. Furthermore, 
He who was now Francis I is alleged to have sold the priests out, even when personally he had promised he would protect them. There will be intrigue. There will be idolatry, chiefest of which will be Mariolatry. His first outing as Pope, did you notice where he went, what he did? It was to pray before a famous icon of the Virgin Mary at the Santa Maria Maggiore Basilica in Rome. This basilica is a special place for Jesuits. And the painting of the Virgin Mary that's housed there, Madonna and Child, called the Salus Populi Romani, English Protectoress of the Roman People. Protectoress translates literally as salvation or health of the Roman people. Now this is historically the most important Marian icon in Rome. And in the painting, although neither Mary nor Jesus wear crowns, the fact that Mary holds in her right hand a mappa or mapula, a certain a sort of embroidered ceremonial handkerchief, it's an imperial symbol, meaning this image is one of the class that shows Mary as the Queen of Heaven. So you've got idolatry. That's already well begun. You have intrigue. Throw in a little insurrection. Why not? With all the generosity of delicious irony. It has been revealed that in a mass in Buenos Aires last year. To mark the 30th anniversary of the 1982 invasion by Argentine forces of the Falkland Islands. Jorge, Mario, Bergoglio, now Francis I, the new Pope, then still Cardinal in Argentina, described Britain as usurpers for ruling the Falkland Islands. He told veterans that day, we come to pray for those who have fallen, sons of the country who went out to defend their mother country, to reclaim that which is theirs and was usurped from them. Nothing like stirring up a little bit of extra insurrection. And of course we'll have the customary dose of immorality. Not hard to predict that before the conclave. That elected him as one of the cardinals booked to travel to be part of that conclave and make it from 115 to 116, the full complement that it should have been. Keith O'Brien, the former head of the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland, became embroiled in disgrace. He now faces a new allegation that he assaulted a priest on the night in which he became a cardinal. Immorality before the conclave even began. And just after the conclave ended, one of those 115 red robed cardinals who had voted in that conclave, Cardinal Wilfred Fox Napier, the Catholic Archbishop of Durban in South Africa, ignited a storm of protest that's still blowing. By stating that paedophilia was an illness, not a crime, and that paedophiles should not be punished. Since then, he's been desperately trying to cover his tracks. Or, in the radio interview, edit his tracks, as the case might be. Pleading as his excuse, it was a, a botched interview, and now offering an apology. It's just pulling back the curtain. On the kind of immorality they have. Where the doctrine of the faith. Offices. Are convened in Rome. Would it surprise you to find out there is a gay sauna in the same building? Would it further surprise you to learn that they're not protesting its existence? Thankfully the one over the town has now closed. The tradition of the Jesuits, the tactics with the Jesuits, we are completely out of time and well over it. My third point 
is as brief as you've ever heard a third point to be. But on this note we must close because everything else has been so dark. The tradition of the Jesuits, the tactics with the Jesuits, the throne against the Jesuits. Pope Francis I, Con celebrated the Mass with the 114 other cardinal electors who had been in the conclave with him. Following the cardinals in a procession, all of them wearing gold vestments to signify joy, the Pope entered into the chapel as a choir sang in Latin, a verse from Matthew 16, the verse 18, which begins, Tu es Petrus, you are Peter. The Pope said, I would like that all of us have the courage, the very courage, to walk in the presence of the Lord with the cross of the Lord, to build the church in the blood of the Lord, which is spilled on the cross, and to confess the only glory, Christ crucified, and in that way the church will move ahead. Sounds very evangelical, admittedly. He speaks up Jesus, but he serves Mary, remember that. He's a Jesuit. It's intrigue. And while he, in his role as chief usurper, abuses the titles of Christ, denies his gospel, steals his offices, prophet, priest, and king, we rest on our Lord's promise in a way that he doesn't. Matthew 16, 18. A confession Jesus made in the devil's own backyard upon this rock. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Truth is, we have no reason to fear. Proverbs 21.1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. He turneth it whithersoever he will. It takes the Jesuits a long time to do that kind of turning, though they try it. God can do it in an instant. Nebuchadnezzar found that out. In Daniel chapter 4, Belshazzar found it out. The record contained in the very next chapter, Daniel chapter 5. Former princes of literal Babylon discovered it, and so too will Francis I. And the entire Vatican structure, the spiritual Babylon, as we discover in Revelation 17 and Revelation 18 as well. Because as the true church of Christ is still being built, going up, their citadels of falsehoods and lies will come down because God is still on the throne and he will have his Samson's that will in a spiritual way without sword or shield pull down the spiritual temple of Dagon today onward Christian soldiers not with Francis orders weaponry Marching as to war, looking on to Jesus who was gone before Christ. The royal master leads against the foe, forward into battle. See his banners go, crowns and thrones may perish. Kingdoms rise and wane, but the church of Jesus constant will remain. Gates of hell can never against that church prevail. We have Christ's own promise. And that cannot fail. Praise God it won't.